Welcome once again to the Daily Connection. Let's pray. Father, uh, as we open up your word and read this extraordinary, uh, fascinating truth about the new heaven, new earth, uh, would you just uh, help us to just stand in all of you, even uh, on the particular points that we cannot fully grasp? Father, you are awesome, uh, and what a privilege it is for us uh, to be your children. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we uh, now come to the new heaven, new earth here in Revelation chapter 21. You probably wondered if we would ever get there. So did I. Well, here we are. Uh, And this is a, uh, we're going to see some very unique truth in these last two chapters of the book of Revelation. The Old Testament said a lot about the millennial kingdom but not a whole lot about eternity or what we could call the eternal order. Uh, That is after the millennial kingdom. How are things going to be for the rest of eternity? The Old Testament doesn't tell us much about that. The last two chapters of Revelation are going to tell us a lot about, uh, at least up through chapter 22, verse 6, a lot about uh, the eternal order, uh, how this is going to work. The first 20 chapters of Revelation itself speaks of events that can be found in some form or fashion elsewhere in Scripture, most specifically in the Old Testament, prophets. But the last two chapters here in Revelation, again, really 21.1 all the way up through 22, verse 6, is really new material uh, that uh, we're not finding uh, in other places in Scripture. Now, this should not surprise us because, after all, we're coming to the last two chapters uh, of God's Overall revelation, I don't just mean the book of Revelation, right? But I mean his special revelation, which is all 66 books. So we shouldn't be surprised that when we come to the last two chapters, uh, that he, sh- he would give us some information that he hadn't given us elsewhere uh, as he revealed his truth. So this is, uh, this is quite uh, exciting. Now, I must say we have to come humbly. Uh, we should always come to God's word humbly, but especially here... Uh, because John is going to describe some things that, uh, that though he's doing it uh, through the help of the Holy Spirit for us, uh, those of us who, though we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, those of us who have never been to heaven, to understand exactly what John is, is saying uh, is going to be extremely difficult. So we want to be humbly, uh, humble as we work through this. Uh, yet, as I always try to do, unless there's a reason to not take the text at face value, Uh, I take the text at face value. Uh, So with that being said, I want to remind you, the millennium uh, is only 1,000 years old, right? As we lead into chapter 21, uh, 1,000 years uh, in its duration, I should say. Now, so here you have this millennial kingdom, 1,000 years long, uh, but now we come uh, to eternity, Now, keep in mind that in the Old Testament, a promise was made in the Davidic covenant. And that promise was this, that there would be a Davidic kingdom. And in this Davidic kingdom, you would have this eternal dynasty. Not just a thousand years, but an eternal dynasty. All right, now, what this means is that this is to be an eternal throne. And uh, so this this is going to be fulfilled throughout eternity. Christ is going to reign. So keep that in mind as we begin chapter 21. Now, we're only going to get through one verse here uh, in this session, but read verse 1 with me, if you will. Revelation chapter 21. John says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, you will remember that in preparation for the great white throne judgment in chapter 20, that the current order of heaven and earth were done away with. They, they fled away from the throne uh, of God. Now we see that the new order, the eternal order, is brought about. Now, there is some debate as to whether or not these are new uh, in the sense uh, of entirely brand new creation, or is it just new in that it is refurbished? Now, I will not lay out all of the arguments on both sides. Both sides can actually pull uh, certain truths from Scripture uh, for support. 
Now, it is my personal view, and you'll want to go do study, as I always encourage you to do. It is my personal view from reading Scripture over the years that both of these ideas are in view, that there are going to be some elements that are entirely new. And then there are other elements that, uh, that the effects of the fall have been done away with, and so it's kind of been refurbished, uh, if you will. But let's talk through this. There are two primary words in the New Testament that mean new. All right, there is, uh, there is one that means new. Uh, naos here that means new in the sense of, uh, of new of the same kind and quality as the original. Okay? So it's the same kind and quality of the original, but yet it's got a newness to it. Then we have another word uh, for new in the New Testament, kainos, which, uh, which has the idea, it has the nuance of meaning new in terms of hasn't existed before. Okay? So really brand new. Uh, so the idea of, of refurbishing would be out with, with this word. Now, I think uh, we ought to think of the new heavens. And again, this is my interpretive opinion. Uh, I think we ought to think of the new heavens and the new earth just as we think of our redeemed bodies. Now, let me explain that. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 5.17, we are said to be what? We're said to be, well, actually 2 Corinthians 5.17, we're said to be what? A new creation, Right? The unbeliever goes from darkness to light. Someone becomes saved, and they are said to be a new creation. Uh, we've become new. The, the old has passed away. The new has come into being. Now, what happens when we become saved? Well, a lot of wonderful things happen, right? A lot of great things that the Lord orchestrates uh, at our salvation. One is we get the, imbi- uh, the indwelling Holy Spirit. And when our salvation is final, that is... Uh, when we have our glorified bodies, when we are uh, outside here uh, of earth, when our salvation is completely final and we have that glorified body, we will no longer have a sin nature, right? Our salvation will be complete. We will no longer have a sin nature. Now, and by the way, that is exactly how we will spend eternity in glorified bodies apart from our sin nature. So the sin nature is gone. We have a new glorified body, yet... Yet, and here's my point, some of the elements of our original bodies appear to remain based on Scripture. So there are entirely new elements, yet still some old elements. Think of this. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, a text that we know very well as we dealt with the second coming and rapture and so forth. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, Paul says that the bodies of believers on earth, Christ will come to the clouds, the body of believers will be raised up to be reunited with their spirits. Right? So I would suggest that the new heaven and the new earth be seen in like manner, in the same way. Now, think of this. When man fell, the effects, the effects of the fall in Genesis chapter 3, it affected all of creation, not just human beings, right? but it affected all of creation. This is why, listen to this, Romans 8, verses 20 and 21. You all know this. Romans 8, 20 and 21. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now listen to this, verse 21. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Do you hear this? All of creation is waiting for the redemption that comes through Christ. All of creation. Not just human beings, but all of creation. All that was marred by the fall can only be redeemed by the Redeemer. And there's only one Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I would suggest that some of the elements of current creation will still exist, but then there will be much uh, in the new heaven and new earth that will be brand new, as in never uh, existed before. Now again, this is just my thinking on the issue as I read through Scripture. Now, one feature, finishing up verse 1, one feature of the new earth is the absence of the ocean. So those of you that love to go to the beach, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) Uh, There is no ocean. Why? I have no idea. 
You can ask God when you get there. I, I have no idea. Now, there are some that think that the sea here really isn't talking about the sea, the ocean, that it's just used symbolically here for evil. Uh, but yet it's found in the same context as we see heaven and earth. So if we think the new heaven and the new earth are really going to be a new heaven and a new earth and aren't symbolic for something that doesn't really exist, then why would we think the sea here isn't symbolic? Uh, seems clear here to me that John is saying, man, I'm looking at this and there's a new heaven, new earth, and uh, I notice, uh, however, that there's no ocean, no sea. And this is coming from a man that is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's writing where? On an island of Patmos. Every day he looks out and sees what? The sea, the ocean. Uh, so it would be, uh, uh, no doubt, uh, it would catch his eye that there isn't uh, an ocean here. All right? Now, uh, this, I believe, means uh, that we won't be doing any fishing in heaven. No fishing in heaven. Sorry, guys. But guess what? We also won't need any life jackets. So look, we're just now beginning to scratch the surface of the new heaven and the new earth. Can't wait until the next time. 